Dawn, it's good to see you. I talked to Jim a bit, but I didn't get to talk to you. But it's so good to see you. Amen. So good to see you. Amen. Uh, we're really excited about today. We wanted to open it up to the whole church, you know, whoever wanted to come could. And uh, most everyone that signed up is here. We have a few that may come in a little late. Uh, but we're really thankful you're here this morning. We're going to do it different this time. We're going to eat after she speaks this morning, okay? And then that way we can uh, just uh, be before the Lord this morning and uh, just enjoy our time with, with Miss Cheryl. Amen. We're so happy to have her here. It's been fun. To me, she's like my, my sister. I never had in, uh, in real life, so to speak. And it's just a lot of fun. We were cutting up and having a good time yesterday. We drove up from... Uh, near Tufalo this mor uh, yesterday afternoon and uh, spent the evening together with Melissa and I and her, and we just had fun, and it was just good. But I'm really excited that she's here. Harry will be here later this afternoon, and uh, we're excited to have, have you guys here. And uh, I just want you all, if you could, stand up. Let's give thanks to God. But at the same time, let's welcome Cheryl Salem this morning. Amen? <laughs> Amen. That's fine. Thank you. My younger brother. <laughs> He's definitely, you sit down for a minute. He's definitely my younger brother, but that's all right. I love having a baby brother. <laughs> I get to tell them what to do. <laughs> Everybody got, I've got my coffee this morning. I got some gifts for you. And I brought my phone up to remind you of something. It was actually to remind me to remind you of something. Uh, since all of this began, I started doing a Bible study live on Instagram, and then I post it every day on YouTube. And uh, if you're not watching that, I think you might enjoy that. Uh, we've already done, I did the book of Ezekiel and didn't save them, the whole book of Ezekiel and didn't save them. Didn't, at the time, you know, you enter into this thing, and we didn't know it was going to last so long, and I was just doing them live every day, and then trashing them you know I, and I have to say there's reason now I look back that I trashed it because I did it every morning in my bathrobe <laughs> in my jumpers no makeup on hadn't even brushed my hair so I'm like really glad I didn't save them but it was a fun time to get everybody into the prophetic books and then I went out of that started saving them in the book of Isaiah all of those are saved on our YouTube channel Salem Family Ministries so um, we did 48 chapters of Ezekiel, 66 chapters of Isaiah, one chapter a day. Then we just did the book of Daniel, 12 chapters. And now we are, I just finished yesterday, the 15th chapter of Genesis. So we're going through the book of Genesis. It's been so fun to build this um, family of people that come on every day. You see their name and they can comment and you become a little family. And the questions that they ask and many different walks of life. Uh, I got a note last night from, there's a whole group on, in Indonesia, uh, the pastor and his wife from over there, uh, we knew them in Michigan, and they became missionaries to Indonesia, so they have their whole church going through the Bible with us every day, and now there's a group in Australia, one in New Zealand, they're all watching us live, so it's fun to study the Bible with people besides the American church that I get to stay in touch with because uh, we're studying the Word together, so it's really fun, and uh, if you don't uh, watch YouTube or you do, it's a, you, all you have to do is search Salem Family Ministries, and uh, when you do, it'll come up. There's almost 300 videos on there, and most of them have been in the last six months. Harry and I do a live uh, Marriage Mondays every Monday night, just talking about marriage and relationships and how we can stay strong in the Lord. And then every Thursday night, we go live on YouTube just to pray. Pray with you, pray for you, uh, prayer requests, pray for the nation. We started it just to pray for the nation, but so many people have prayer requests during this season. They've begun to ask them, and we just pray as a group for one another. So it's been really fun. It's a great way we've stayed, uh, been able to stay in touch with the church. So even though uh, things happen, we have to learn to adjust to the move of God in every situation. And as you all know, that I don't have to talk faith to this church. I know you're walking by faith and believing God and doing what you feel is right. I feel like the greatest challenge that we have as a church body is to simply fight for our freedom to worship God and do whatever it is we feel led to do in our nation. And so I'm encouraging you to do what you feel is right for you. Uh, if wearing a mask makes you comfortable, you should have one on. 
And so that's, I'm encouraging you to do that because that's how, where you feel comfortable. And that's the, the Holy Spirit's our comforter. And we should not be judging one another. This is not a time to be judging. It's a time to be loving. And when the love of God can go forth, we can be comforted in knowing that his love is covering everything. And we cannot focus on what's going on around us. We have to focus on what's going on within us. And as we walk with God, our worship can be coming up in a time we're learning how to worship God. Uh, we do school of worships, and Harry and I train uh, school of worshipers, and we had one in July. Uh, they canceled, the hotel canceled three conferences that we had, uh, two, one in May and two in June. But in July came, we found one hotel in our area that was open. We live in California. And so they allowed us to move our school over there, and uh, we had our school there. And I circle up in our school. We circle up two or three times a day. We pray in the Holy Ghost together. We sing in the Holy Spirit together. We interpret in the Holy Spirit. And I said, Lord, how are we going to do this and not break the law? But he wouldn't tell me. He just said, just do it as I tell you. And so it came time to circle up, and I said to the students, circle up. And they all got up, and they circled up, and I said, Lord, now what? They're all looking at each other, and it's against the law here to sing facing each other. I don't know if y'all realize that was a law in California, but the governor mandated that you can't sing in church. And so, um, so I said, Lord, what are we going to do? Because we're going to sing. Do I break the law? What do you want me to do? And he said, turn them outward. Keep them in a circle, but turn them outward. So everyone faced away from one another, and they faced the wall. And I thought, how are we going to get intimacy with this? Well, you know what it did is it, it helped me teach them how to worship God and not sing for people. It taught them how to be alone with God in their worship. And four girls in their, 20 who came to the, in their 20s who came to the school that had never received the Holy Spirit, never received their prayer language, facing the wall. I'm not even praying for them to receive the Holy Spirit yet. I haven't even talked to them about it except to tell them to prophesy to them, you're going to receive your prayer language today. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit today. I'd been prophesying to them, but I hadn't prayed for them. I hadn't taught them, and I had them face the wall and worship God with an audience of one, we stand before the King of Kings and we worship him. And as I did that, all four of those girls facing the wall got filled with the Holy Ghost and received their prayer language. So in this season, we need to learn that maybe we're not doing things the way we've always done them, but maybe we'll learn how to do them better in this season. Instead of saying, I can't wait till it goes back to normal, I tell you what, I didn't love what we had. So why would I want it back? <laughs> we had a whole lot of performance. We had a whole lot of people who came to church who didn't really love God, who didn't know how to be with God, who didn't know how to be along with God. And so I feel like this has been a great opportunity for us to learn how to just worship the king by ourselves, worshiping him. And if you can worship him in a group by yourself, you can worship him in your car and in the bathroom and while you're cleaning potties and while you're doing whatever else God asks you to do, you men out in the yard and cutting trees and whatever else you're doing, we can learn how to worship God. And it's time, don't you think? It's time that the church becomes the real church. And that we learn how to have an audience of one without people pleasing, without worrying about what people are thinking or what people are doing. We're just here with the king. And everywhere we are, we should just be here, wherever that is, with the king. So I'm going to encourage you this morning, if you will, stand to your feet. And if you don't want to face me, you don't have to. If you don't want to face each other, go find the wall. <laughs> I don't care. We are free to worship God. And I, I don't know if you found the lyrics. Did you find the lyrics? Awesome. So there will be lyrics up on your screen. But what my encouragement to you is to learn how to worship God and be alone with him even when there's more than one here. Learning how not to worry about what anybody's thinking or saying or if they're looking at you or not looking at you or listening to you or not listening to you. For we have an hallelujah praise so that the stronghold of ragash, division, rage, anger, hatred must come down. As we worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, we hold nothing back, Father. Our sound becomes the weapon we use for the glory. I raise a hallelujah. We build a wall of praise. Come on, don't worry about being led. Just sing to the king. 
We raise a hallelujah, Father. We are not afraid to fight. We are not afraid. We fight the good fight of faith. We don't fight people. We don't fight culture. We fight the enemy that's trying to take us down. In the name of Jesus, we stand strong. Be still and see the salvation of the Lord. You will not need to fight in this battle, says the Lord. Position yourselves with your hands raised and your voices high. Don't fear, for I am with you. The battle is not yours, but God's. This is how we fight. This is how we fight our war. warfare. It's all inside the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is how I fight my battles. This is how we fight our battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by your glory. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by your presence. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by your angels. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battle. We fight our battles. With our worship, Lord, this is how I fight my battles. On my knees, with my hands lifted high, Lord, this is how I fight my battles. We worship you, we worship you in spirit and truth. This is how I fight, my, is how I fight my battles, Lord. Let both so It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by your presence. Like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by your glory. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by your angels. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by your 
position ourselves for the victory in you. This is how I fight my battle. I use the weapon that always cuts both ways. Fight my battles with your word, Lord, with your power and your strength. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Say it one more time. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Tell him again. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Thank you, Father. Father, we're crying out for your spirit to overtake us to fill us, Father, with the very glory of who you are. We are your vessels. We empty ourselves before you, Lord. We ask you, Father, for a more intimate position with you than ever before. I want to know more about who you are. I long for my worship to touch your heart I want to go to that place where I can see you face to face let the deepest part of me pray Who gives me breath? 
Reviver, our quickener, our repairer. And Father, as we stand in the gap and receive this for ourselves, we also thank you that we receive this for our nation. In the name of Jesus. Peace be.
So many times I think we get in too big a hurry and don't spend the time that we need to get over ourselves so that we can hear the Spirit of God speak to us. And y'all don't do this here, but in most of the church culture that we know uh, now, they're in such a rush to empty the service and start the next one or whatever. And I understand that uh, we have to be aware of children's workers and parking lot attendants and all that has to happen with church in our society today. But so much of it we have rushed the Spirit of God. <laughs> We still want him to move, but we want him to move on our timeline and in the time frame that we give him to move. You've got eight minutes, God, move, you know. <laughs> and I think that part of what this, I've looked at in this season that we've just come through, and I call it come through because I, be, I believe and I'm prophesying that we are on the other side of it, and I certainly believe that those who are going to succumb to fear have done so. And those that have decided that they're not going to be afraid have also done so. Yeah. And we're walking out. And uh, I'm not saying that we don't take precautions. Uh, we do take precautions. I wash my hands more than I've ever washed my hands. I wear a mask from the time I get on an airplane until the time I get back home. And because I don't know all those people. And I certainly don't know in that tin can what kind of air they're circulating. Right. But So there are things that we do to take precautions. But I will not allow the enemy to put me in isolation right, right. when God has called me to solitude and that's the way I went into this as solitude yeah. solitude with the Spirit of God yeah. I refuse to allow the enemy to call something isolation when God said come away with me and be with me and let me train you and teach you because I believe with all of my heart that there will be no going back to the way we were. I believe with all of my heart that we're going to have to learn to stand in yeah. a season and learn who we are so that we can be the church when the world has lost its head and gone crazy. It is time for us to have the Spirit of God keeping us in peace and us being that peace that passes all understanding. For in this season, it seems as if understanding has gone out the window. Yeah. And so much other things I could say have gone out the window. As my husband, the other night, Harry was praying for common sense to be restored. Yeah. He's like, Lord, just exactly. restore yeah. common sense. It's yeah. like, no, everybody's lost their common sense. And so uh, I do believe that we need some common sense. And right now it's very uncommon. It's very uncommon sense because it is not common. But we need that to be restored. And we need the spirit of stupid to get off America. Yeah. I mean, there's just been a spirit of stupid. It, it's like, okay, I wear the mask while I walk in, but when I sit down, I'm okay to take it off. Exactly. Really? It's the same air. So either I need to keep it on or take it off. I don't know which it is. But there, there's just some things that, and you guys live here. And the South is a little different, but you should be in California. You know, you can't do anybody's hair or a pedicure or a manicure, and you can't have church, and you sure can't sing or chant. That means pray. You can't do any of that because that, that might spread the virus. But you can go to the casino. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Or you can go to your yoga class. That's okay, but all the gyms are closed. I'm just like, this is not sensible. Do you understand? So we, the church, cannot pick up the ways and the culture of the world. We have to get our leading by the Holy Ghost. And there is a mandate. You talk about a mandate coming from the throne room of heaven that says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Right. So thank God that we've been able to be online and be together, even uh, though there were times when we couldn't gather in the building. Thank God we could be together. And I love that technology was birthed and brought forth, and I know the enemy meant it for him, but God turned it for good in every church that had never had an online service had an online service. Yeah. And we were able to go around the world. And, and honestly, the word of God has been preached to every nation because of the Internet. Yes. And we have been around the world. And honestly, I don't know of another thing that needs to be fulfilled now that the peace treaty has been signed with the Arab nations around Israel. Right. I mean, it's, and, and it's like the news didn't even hardly report that. That was a massive thing for the church yeah. that just happened. And Jesus is coming. Yeah. And so the words on our mouth should be, Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Yeah. That's what we should be saying with a big smile. And I laughingly say, behind my mask, I keep pulling it down so people know I'm smiling back here. 
<laughs> I'm smiling back here. I want you to know I'm smiling when I say Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I'm happy about it. Yeah. I'm happy about the coming of the Lord. I want to share some things with you the Lord's given me. Um, and then uh, I want you to turn to the book of John. Uh, the Lord just gave me this this morning. Uh, the book of John, chapter 11, and then also I'm going to ask you to turn to um, Genesis, chapter 18. These are the two things the Lord gave me this morning, so it's fresh from heaven for you. I did grab some things to give you this morning. I think I grabbed enough for every family and maybe even for more than that. My uh, book, Women of the Nation, pray the script, learning how to pray the scriptures, learn how to pray the word. Uh, there's no reason to pray our craziness when we should be praying the word of God. Uh, who doesn't have this book who would like it? Uh, and it's for men, too. I just called it Women of the Nation Pray because I usually talk to women. And um, this is the book of Ruth. I sing every word of the book of Ruth prophetically to you who would like that. Anybody on this table over here? And then um, I love to sing the scriptures because that's a good way to get it past people's um, understanding into their spirit. Um, these were some I found at my mama's house. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to bring one for uh, everybody. And then, let me see here. In the middle of all this, I should have grabbed some of that. I'm just going to hand out, that's my testimony and some worship and a live service. Same here, just pass them around. Everybody take one. And then pass them to the next table. This one is my head is in heaven. Yes, would you do that? Awesome. And then I grabbed I forgot to get my brand new worship CD, um, Teach Us How to Pray, which is uh, what I just sang every song from this one. Uh, anybody want that one? You want that one? All right, there you go. You'll give up the other one to yeah, take I'll that one. one. All right. And then um, this one is the excerpts from the Song of Solomon sung to you. And this, yeah, you're going to love this. You want this one? All right, this is what the Spirit of God had me do. He had me, uh, who hasn't got a CD yet? Oh, you haven't got a CD, all right, sorry. <laughs> you had one in your hand and I thought they didn't. Um, this is what he had me sing, uh, Pastor, you're going to love this. He said, only sing to them what I said about them. Don't sing to them what the Sh Shunammites said, what the bride's uh, attendant said, what the world said, even what they said, what the bride said to the bridegroom. He said, don't sing that because she disqualified herself every time she said something. Yeah. Just sing to her what I say about her so that she begins to know how I see her. And as if we understand how Jesus sees us, how the bridegroom sees us, we will act differently. We will talk differently. We will speak differently. We will even worship differently when we understand who we really are. So we're living in a day and an age like one I've never seen in, in my lifetime. And I began to search the heart of God out in this season. And I, if you followed me enough, you know I love numbers. I love how God speaks to me through numbers. Is there anybody else that, that God speaks to through numbers? And, and his word is filled with numbers. And most of the time we just read right over them and don't see them because we're not always tuned to see the numbers. But when God says third, anytime he says third, he's talking to the bride. Even with David and, and on the third day they went in and took all the spoil, he's talking to the bride. It was on the third day he was resurrected. He didn't resurrect for the whole world. He resurrected for the bride. He came for the bride. He died for the bride. Why? For the one who will accept him. That's why he did what he did on the third day. So numbers are vitally important. So I began to study out when we went into this, what do the numbers in the Word of God say to us about this season that we're in? And I always start every year studying out the year of the 20. Here we are, 2020. 20 means redemption, and now we have double redeemed. It's the year of the redeemed, but it's even the 100 years of the redeemed because it's been 20 and then it's been 20 
2001, then 2002. It's been the whole 20 years of the redeemed. God's been talking to the redeemed for 20 years. And when we hit this year, it is 2020. So it's double redeemed. God is saying redeemed, redeemed. And anytime you double anything, it's the highest position it could be in the Hebrew right. language. That's why the Bible is six, six books, 66 books. That's why when he said king of kings, double in the king. He said, Lord of Lords. Why? That means it's the highest position there is. That's why we call him King of Kings, Lord of Lords. You double the word. That's why it's called the Holy of Holies. Because the moment you double something, it becomes the deepest, the highest, the most. There is nothing greater than that. And so when he doubled the name 2020 in this year, I knew this was going to be the greatest year of the redeemed that we have ever experienced. And that's why it was so important that the church not get into fear. Right. The world can fear all they want to. They don't have any way not to. But we have shalom, the one who covers us in peace. We have the one who keeps us from being afraid, and we step into it. So I began to prophesy, and Harry and I began to preach the beginning of this year, 2020, the year of the redeemed, the year of the double redeemed, the highest level of redemption. And we didn't just enter the year of it. We actually entered the decade of it. For 10 years, we will stay in 2020, 2020. 21, 2022, 2023, we will be in the double year of redeem for the next 10 years. The church is positioned for the greatest outpouring of the history of the church this decade and beginning this year. So it is no wonder that the Antichrist spirit tried to do this thing and try to separate the church, try to make us all stay home, try to keep us from worshiping the king, try to get us all in fear. It is no wonder because the Antichrist has nothing to do except go anti of what God is doing. So when God has already started this great redeemed time frame for us, and then it ties on top of the Jewish year that began last September, and we're about to begin a new one on September the 18th. Yeah. Last year in the fall, the Jewish numbers year was 5780. It not only began the year of 80, which is the year of the mouth, but it was also the decade of the mouth. And it is by no coincidence that God laid one right on top of the other, 5780, 80 means the year of the mouth. In the Jewish uh, Hebrew work, you have to start on the right and read left. So 80 is the first. So that would be the year of the mouth or the decade of the mouth. Is this not amazing that God is calling us in this decade to use our mouth and the enemy comes along and tries to cover up our mouth? to say, no, it is not the year of the mouth. No, it is not the decade of the mouth. No, we are the year of the mouth. And even if I put on a mask, I can still make sound. I can still prophesy. I can still pray. I can still worship. You can't cover my sound with a piece of fabric. You see, we must be strong and understand the timing of what God is doing. And so 80 means the year or the, even the decade of the mouth. So it's not going to end in September. It's only begun the decade of the mouth. And then 7 is the next number, which means it is finished. And then 5 is grace. So God is saying last year he began the decade of the mouth proclaiming it is finished, Jesus is coming yes. with grace. Yeah. So that we say it with love and grace so it can be understood, not judgment. Too many people are prophesying judgment and gloom and doom when we should be standing in the gap and prophesying redemption, redemption, yeah. redemption. This is the year of the mouth. It is finished. Jesus is coming. The grace of God is here. We deserve hell, but we get to go to heaven when we receive Jesus. Yeah. This is what should be coming out of our mouths right now. Yeah. And it should be with such grace and love that people feel like, yes, it's my season. We began this year 2020. And, and of course, I also said, of course, 2020, we have to take it into our natural realm of what we would say 2020 means, clear, clear vision, clarity, uh, the year the eyes of the church is open, the year we'll see what has been closed up and hidden for the last days. When God spoke to Daniel and said, 
close that up until the last days. He didn't say forever. We're in the last days. Yeah. God's opening up and revealing things to us that the church has not been able to see for many, many hundreds of years. We can see it now because 2020, we have clarity. We have clear vision. Harry and I started praying this and prophesying it around November that what was coming. So we get up first day of January. We have our New Year's time with our family, and then we get on an airplane. We fly to New Jersey. I cannot get my contacts in that morning. We get on the plane. I was going to read and study. I can't see through my contacts. I, I couldn't get them in this morning. I get out my glasses to read on the plane. I can't see through my glasses. I think, well, it's really early. We got up at 4 o'clock to catch the plane, and uh, that's probably why I can't see. So we get to the, we get home. We get, we get to the church. We get to the hotel, you know, when you've lived on the road for 40 years, 41 now. Uh, the, the hotel's your home. So we get home that night. We get in the hotel, and the next morning we got up early to go do service on a Saturday, and I can't get my contact to go in. I try to read with my glasses. Thank God I have a good memory. I could know my scripture without seeing it. I couldn't see a thing with my glasses on. Next day we get up. We do three services in their church, and, and I, again, can't get my contacts in, can't see through my glasses. And through the whole day, it never dawned on me, I got home the next morning. We had a school waiting, a school of worship waiting. People had flown in from all over the country. I didn't even try. I'm like, contacts are, are not working. Something's wrong with them. I got to go back to the doctor, get a new set or something. And so I do the whole day, teach eight hours that day, teaching from the Word of God, never thinking that I don't have my glasses on and I don't have my contacts in. And I'm reading the tiniest little print of these new Passion translations. And on the way home, I realize. My eyes are healed. Amen. I have perfect vision. I have perfect vision. I have not had my glasses on since January the 1st, awesome. the year of 2020. You see, we need to expect God to do things. Instead of knowing he can, we need to expect them to be happening in our lives. In our lives. And so, in this wonderful year, that we are in, and we're about to turn over 5781, which means the year of the mouth. And I was looking, and you will love this. You will love this. God gave me for Pentecost. He said, I want you to take the numbers and turn them into tones. And so I, I did exactly that. I just took the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, and I took the scale. You have to have do to start. So you know what key you're in. And then re is actually do, di, re, re. It's a minor third. So that would have been the 2020. Re. And then so, that would be five. And t, that would be seven. So those are the tones that God had me release on Pentecost. And we did a whole three-hour virtual conference online. We had thousands of people. I cannot hardly fathom what God has done in this season. Watching three, that's a long time to watch something online, three hours. And, and I released these tones after I taught what God had given me about those numbers and what they meant. And the Holy Spirit said, release the sounds, for the sounds will release my presence. So we did it. I had a track built five minutes long with shofars playing those tones. And then I just sang those tones in the spirit as we released them. And, and it is so prophetic and it is it moves you even in your cellular level. You can feel it. And it's not necessarily pretty because do, re, so, t, that t really throws you off up there. But that's what God said. Now this year we will go 580. 81, 5781, so we get to resolve it, which will be nice. When we get to the point we can resolve from the 7 to the 8, which will be nice. But right now, he had me release these tones. Okay, I'm like, Lord, I'm just one little girl. I, I'm, I'm, I'm making these sounds, and people are making them all over the country, but still... Why would you even ask me to do this? How can this do anything? And how, how many of you have done like I just did? And we disqualify ourselves because we say, I'm just one person. Nobody's listening to me. Nobody's paying me any mind. What is my sound? What is my prayer going to do to change the nation? Anybody else ever feel that kind of way? Like, well, I know you're, I feel that you're asking me to do it, but why? Why don't you ask somebody with a bigger voice, with more influence? Anybody else feel that way? God knows what kind of influence you have in the spirit. He is not looking for people with influence in the natural. He's looking for people who have influence in the spirit. 
And so I just obeyed God and honestly felt as foolish as could be. Thomas, I felt so foolish, but I just did what God asked me to do. And I released the sounds. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Five minutes plus a few seconds, we released do re so ti and sang them and the tr everything was going forth. I really felt foolish, but I just kept doing it. Two weeks later, people start sending me videos of the Golden Gate Bridge singing. Have you seen this? <laughs> right after Pentecost, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco started singing. And I don't mean a little. So loud the city said that it's driving us crazy. <laughs> we think we might be losing our minds. It is so loud. People are just holding up their cell phones and capturing the tones. It is so loud. Now what happened was they were repairing it and they put wood slats in it to try to stabilize. Well, they made it a woodwind instrument. <laughs> but let me just ask you, can you imagine what tones it's singing? <laughs> Do, re, so, ti. We released it and the bridge started singing. Wow. So many times you don't realize why God's asking you to do something. So many times you cannot fathom what he's going to do. Yeah. But we released the tones in Southern California. The bridge in Northern California started singing, yeah. and I believe crying out for repentance from yeah. the West, yeah. crying out yeah. through do, which means unison with God, re, which means redeemed, repair, restore, revive, reset, all the re words that you can come up with, and I found hundreds of them, and then soul, grace, it is finished. And as the bridge began to sing it, repentance should have happened, but it didn't. So the fires began. God has always given us a chance to repent. He will never send judgment before he gives an opportunity to repent. And so I'm asking you to pray with me for the continued ability for the people of God. And, and you, I hope you heard what I said, the people of God to repent. For that is the truth of where we are in our society. I believe that God gave me uh, a, a powerful word in this season. I believe that he said he wants to birth two things. From this time frame that we are in, he does want to birth re, here's the words, revival. But revival is something that's birthed from the tomb. God spoke to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37, and he said, can these dry bones or these dead bones, can this nation live? That's what he was saying. The whole nation, he showed him the whole nation of Israel dead and already shriveled up to just dry bones. And he asked the prophet, can these dry bones live? And the prophet Ezekiel was smart enough to say, only you know, Lord. And God began to talk to him to, year of the mouth, speak to the deadness of the nation. Prophesy to the dead place. Prophesy to the nation. Make the sound wave coming out of you begin to reverberate inside of the deadness of the nation. And as he did, revival happened. Revival comes from the tomb. It's a birthing from what was. We revive what has happened before, and we want to happen it again. And we cry out for revival. How many of you have been crying out for revival? So what we've been asking God to do is to do something you've done before, do it again. And that comes from the tomb. We are birthing something from what was, and we want it to come back alive. But the Renaissance sound that I hear God saying when I release these do, re, so, ti tones, that's a sound that it's not even pleasant. It's not a... a, a thing you would write a song on. It's not, it's not what we've ever heard before, what our ears are tuned to. It's a renaissance sound. And the first known period of the renaissance, another reword, the first known period of that was birth out of the black plague. 
the very first time we used the word renaissance, it began an era of humanity called the renaissance period. And what it meant was a sound that had never been heard before. A word that had never been heard before. A people that had never been seen before. We are not just asking God for a revival. We don't just need something birthed from the tomb. We need something birthed from the womb of God. Something that's never been heard before. Something that's never been seen. I don't know about you, but I don't want to hear another manufactured word that I've heard 50 times. I would like to hear something new. I'd like to hear a new sound from heaven and that is what we would refer to Acts chapter 2 for when the Holy Spirit was given to the earth something new that had never been heard before was birthed on the earth and he didn't play instruments he played people the sound came out of people there were no instruments in the upper room there was 120 God made people instruments Romans 6.13 says, do, do not yield your instrument to wickedness, but rather yield your instrument to righteousness. God is talking to us, the church, right now. And he's saying, who are you yielding your instrument to? Who's playing you? Are you just regurgitating back out what you've read or heard on the news or seen on Facebook? Or are you, are you regurgitating conspiracy theories? Are you regurgitating all the stuff that's going on? Or are you going to birth something that's never been heard before by the Spirit of God coming out of us? It's time for us to have a new outpouring of the Holy Ghost in America and in the American church. And we need it to be something that we've never heard before. So we need revival and renaissance to come together. We need a birthing from the tomb, and we need a birthing from the womb, and we need them both to hit the American church, and that's why I will not ask God to give us back what we had, because what we had was dead, and we need life. We need some people getting healed and saved and delivered and set free. We need the whole nation to be turning forth to the God that we say is one nation under God, and yet they worship culture more than they worship our God. And it is time that we check our own selves and see what other little gods we have in our closet that need to be gotten rid of so that we stop bowing to culture and we start bowing to the one true God who can turn this whole thing around and not just take us back to where we were, but they can take us to a place of true revival and renaissance, but that only is birthed out of repentance. Repentance. The retone that God is asking for in this next, we're almost finished with the first year, with the next nine years, I honestly believe that we don't have much more than that, if that. For if, in fact, Israel does sign, and if, in fact, other Arab nations do align, and the borders of Israel come down, and peace is on every side of Israel, you can start counting the clock. There will be seven years from that moment until the middle of the tribulation when the Antichrist sets up the abomination of desolation, it's written in the scripture. You can't undo what's written. Right. It is written. That's a time frame that nobody really talks about, but it's right in the scripture in Isaiah. So let me just show you what the Lord gave me specifically for you. That was all just a setup. <laughs> I know you're probably hungry, but you can get over it. <laughs> Harry's not here, and I actually finished a thought. And he would say, oh, Lord, are you kidding me? <laughs> Help me. You're the one that interrupts me a thousand times. And I do. It's just an intersection, divine intersection. In uh, John 11, this is what the Lord showed me this morning for you. Now, a certain man named Lazarus was sick, and he was from Bethany, the village where Mary and his sister Martha lived. And this is what the Lord said to me. He said, I realize that this is written about 
an actual historical event that happened. He said, but I want you to look at it as a prophetic event. And he says, where you see man or you see the name of Lazarus, I want you to put in the word nation. And where you see Mary and Martha, I want you to put in my church. So he said, now a certain nation was sick. The nation was from Bethany, the village where the church lived. America is the nation where the church lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't always understand it, but there's like, what, 330 million people here, is that right? And out of that group, 200 million people say that the God, that, that our God is their Lord. Now, I don't see that, but that's what the census says. That's 75% of the nation whose God is the Lord. There's not another nation in the world like America. The church may not act like the church, but they say they are. That's 75% of the church living in America. We have a right here because of the church. The rest of the nation has survived because of the church. We have been the only force that has held off the darkness. We cannot back up or get tired or weary or quit because the enemy is waiting. He's ever, sin is crouching at the door, <laughs> waiting for us to give up and quit and get weary and tired and say we can't do it anymore. We must stay vigilant. We must become true watchmen on the wall, not just praying but watching looking, seeing, here comes the darkness. No, you won't. And we start pushing it back. Yes. Yes. That's our responsibility. Yes. But if we, this nation, fall, we are the Christian nation to the world. We're the ones who sends the food. We're the ones. It's not the nation. We, the nation sends food because we're the church is here. Mm -hmm. It's the church who's fed people during this. It's the church who's prayed for people when other people would not pray or say anything or even come out of darkness. Yes. We, the church, have held back the darkness here, and we cannot back off now. We cannot back off now. It was the church, verse 2, who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. The nation was sick. Everybody can agree the nation is sick. When Jesus heard this, he said, and I want you to hear what Jesus prophesies about America. This sickness will not end in death. This sickness will not end the nation of America in the death of America. On the contrary, it is for the glory and honor of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now, God did not put this on America. God did not do this to America, but he will use it for his glory if the church will arise and stop acting like the world. Now, Jesus loved and was concerned about the church and the nation. And considered them dear friends. We need to understand that we are a friend of God. We're not just a servant. Servants beg and plead and make demands and I got to have you to do something. But a friend talks and stands in the gap and is not afraid and realizes we have influence. We act like we don't influence God, but we have scripture throughout that says we do influence God. He says in Isaiah, come and contend with me, and I will contend with you as a friend. We, we negotiate. I love that word, negotiate. God says, negotiate with me for the righteous people. Negotiate. I, I love it when you will try to influence me. God needs us to influence him to stay the hand of the enemy off of our land. But we have to not just sit around and say, God, do something. He's like, you need to do something. 
I need you, the church, to negotiate with me. I need you to stand in the gap and stop waiting for somebody else to do something. You do something. Amen. Right? Yes. So even when Jesus heard that the nation was sick, he stayed in the same place two more days. So many times I've heard people say, if God is the God of this nation, why hasn't he done something? So many times it's because he gave us the power and the authority. What are we doing? Hiding in caves? Hidden in holes? Like we don't have the power and ability of the Most High God inside of us? Then Jesus said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews not only recently going, or were going to stone you, and you're thinking you want to go back there again? Jesus said, Are there not 12 hours of light in the day? Anyone who walks in the daytime does not stumble because he sees by the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. We need to ask for the light to be turned back up in the church. Yeah. Because the church acts like it's stumbling around in the dark. Yeah. But we are the light of God. It is his glory that houses inside of us. Yeah. We are not in the dark. We need to stop acting like we are. Right. He said this, and after that, he said, Our friend, the nation of America, has fallen asleep. But I am going there to wake the nation isn't it time that we let him come in through us and wake up the nation? We've allowed the nation to go into a deep coma. But the nation can come out of a coma. But we have to wake them up. We have to make our sound a lot louder than we've been. And our influence has to go to our neighbors and our neighborhoods and our workplaces and we we need to stop waiting for some big massive revival to hit the nation when the massive revival needs to hit us i need to be revived so i can revive my neighbors and my co-workers and my family it's up to me to be that revival going on and then the renaissance of god the disciples said lord if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Jesus had spoken of the nation's death, but they thought that he was referring to their natural sleep. So then Jesus told them plainly, America is dead. Sometimes we need to hear that. We need to realize that we need a resurrection of the dead. And what is that inside the nation that we need resurrected? The church. The church needs a resurrection. Yeah. And I want to know if what we've just gone through is enough of a shock of the paddles to wake up the dead church. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, in other words, so that you can see what the power of God can do. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, who was called Didymus a twin, said to his fellow disciples, well, let us go too. We may as well die with him. He was pitiful, wasn't he? <laughs> Don't act like that, Thomas. I mean, he, he, at least he went, but he went fatalistic. Yeah. He went, okay, well, he's going to die. We might as well all die with him. Anybody live with somebody like that? <laughs> it doesn't affect your faith unless you let it. It didn't stop Jesus, no matter what they said around him. Even the ones he loved said ridiculous things, and he just kept moving. So don't tell me, well, I'm this way because I live with that one. Mm -mm, that's a choice you make. You are this way because you chose to be. Wherever you are, you chose it. So when Jesus arrived... He found that the nation had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, I want to read to you. Jesus purposefully stayed away for four days after Lazarus' death because of culture. 
The Jews believe the soul hovered around the body for three days, during which there was still hope for resurrection. So he waited till the fourth day, and four means earth. He waited until there was no cultural superstition. Hello. There was no cultural superstition that the dead could be raised. So he waited to be El Shaddai, the God of the impossible, to awaken and bring the nation back to life. And so many of us need to understand that no matter how bad it looks, that God can and will raise America from the dead because we, the church, will stand in our position and plead the case of America before the righteous judge. And we have the right to do it as his friend. Now, I want you to, I could spend all day in here because the Lord downloaded the whole thing to me this morning. But I want you to skip over and I want you to look, and you, I want you to ra- read through all of it this afternoon if you have time and take a look at it. But I want you to skip over to like verse 40. No, verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. That's what the enemy has tried to do with us. The, it covered the mouth, the mouth of the tomb. Yep. It covered the mouth. I'm saying it again. It covered the mouth of the tomb. Jesus said, take away the covering on the mouth. Now, I'm not saying take your mask off. I'm saying it's time we find our mouth to speak again, to worship again, to proclaim again, to declare again, to intercede again. It's time that we take off the demonic antichrist who puts his hand over our mouths and says, you can't speak. You can't say anything. We are the church of Jesus Christ, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church and the stone that has been covering our mouths and telling us that we're a dead church and a dead nation is about to be rolled away, and our mouths are going to start speaking again the glory of God. Jesus said, take away the stone. He said to the church, She said, Lord, by this time, there's an offensive odor, for he's been dead four days. It's hopeless, Jesus said to the church. Did I not say to you that if you believe in me, you will see the glory of God? I'm about to prophesy. America is about to see the glory of God. America is about to witness and experience the glory of God for the stone is being rolled away from the mouth of the church and we are about to come out of the dead zone and step into the life of God and you watch what God will do in America. We are not done. We have only just begun. We are not done. We have only just begun. Write write that song, Thomas. We are not done. We've only just begun. The stone has been rolled away from our mouths, and we are finding the glory of God coming forth. (laughs) Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. He began to speak. I knew that you always hear me, and I love how he prayed. Father, I thank you that you've heard me. We need to understand Jesus was not saying this to remind the Father. (laughs) He was saying this to remind the church. Thank you that you've always heard me. Thank you. I knew that you always hear me, and I know that you listen to me. All the cries of the church over the last six months, God has heard every one. He's not turned a deaf ear to what we're saying. It it may look like he's delaying, but he's not delaying. There is a perfect time for the deliverance of the church of America. There is a perfect time for the church to rise up. But what we must do is we must find our voices and start proclaiming and prophesying for those who are too afraid to come out of the tomb. So we must be louder for them. But I have said this because of the people standing around so that they may believe that you've sent me and that you have made me your representative. When he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, America, 
come out. Yes. Glory. I love that. Out came the nation who had been dead, hands and feet tied, wrapped in burial clothes, and in a burial cloth wrapped around the face of America. Jesus said to the nation and those around watching, unwrap him and release him. Unwrap the nation. Release the nation. Unwrap the nation from the dead things. Release the nation for the glory of God. Unwrap the nation from the dead things. Release the nation for the glory of God. Yeah. We must find our prophetic voice. Yeah. So then many of those who had come to be with the church were eyewitnesses to what Jesus had done. They believed in him. When the nation arises and finds her voice, yes. many who did not believe, yes. and I love that it specifically says here the Jews, for it is that last day's Jewish church resurrection that we need to fulfill the bride of Christ. Yes. It is time that the Gentile bride stands in the gap for the Jewish bride yes. so that the Jewish and the Gentile bride can become one and he will come for us. But we have been so self-focused and so selfish thinking that we're the only one. It is time for us, the Gentile bride, to awaken and stand in the gap as Esther did for the Jews. Father, thank you that you awaken the Jews that you have already ordained to be in your bride position, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you are awakening them even within our own nation. And I thank you, Lord, that as we, the church, arise and cry out for the dead things to go and for the release of the church, that the Jews will be watching and I thank you Lord that America stands with Israel and I thank you that as we stand with Israel we cry out for the peace of Jerusalem we cry out for the bride of Christ to be finished both Gentile and Jewish bride to be complete so that you can come and get us out of here in the name of Jesus Amen. glory to God the only other thing I wanted to share with you was Genesis 18, and I'll just do it within two minutes. In Genesis 18, and this is where I believe we are, it is time for the Abrahams to arise. For in this particular instance in Genesis 18, I'm getting around to about verse uh, 20. Yahweh explained to Abraham the outcry of justice against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so blatant that I must go down and see if their wicked actions are as great as the outrage that has come to me. And if not, then I will know. And what do we need to hear from that verse? There's so many people saying how far gone America is. There's so many people, even the church, saying how horrible it is and how bad it is. We are forgetting that God is listening to us and he has to respond to what we are saying, to what we are praying. And, and no matter what others are saying, we need to be standing in the gap for our nation as I read to you out of John 11. We need to be saying that America is saved that America is righteous, that America is holy. We need to be proclaiming the goodness of God over our nation yeah. instead of aligning our words with the, the antichrist media. Yeah. Yeah. We need to stop saying what the media is saying and start saying what God is saying. Yeah. And God is saying that he has to listen to us and he has to do what he has to do according to what we're saying. Yeah. So what are we saying? Yeah. We need to be careful. As Yahweh's two companions went on towards Sodom, Abram remained there. And I want you to listen to this one phrase. As Yahweh paused before Abraham. Isn't that interesting? This verse is listed as a rare instance and Masoretic Interference with the text known as Scribal Corrections. The implication is that the text needed to be amended to read Abraham still stood before the Lord. But the translator has left this in its original state to read in proper transition. As translated from the oldest manuscript, God paused before 
as translated from the oldest manuscript, God paused before Abram, Abraham, giving him time to ponder, listen for this, and ask for mercy for the city. God paused before Abraham to say, do you have anything to say for the nation? Do you have anything to say? He just waited. The two other destroyers went on ahead, but God paused to say, will you stand before the righteous judge? Do you, will you witness for America? Will you say America is one nation under God? Will you say that we are still one nation under God? Will you be the one who stands in the gap? I'm just pausing, waiting for somebody to say something that will help me save the nation. Don't you love that? He's waiting for us. You say, why is this not over yet? God is pausing. He's waiting. He's waiting for the church. We don't need America to be judged. And people say, this is the judgment of America. Uh Uh-uh. If God judged America, there'd be a whole lot more dead. There'd be a whole lot more fires than what we're seeing right now. There'd be a whole lot more hurricanes and a whole lot more earthquakes and a whole lot more tornadoes. If God brings judgment. One time I said to the Lord, Lord, I know the word says you're a still small voice, but could you speak up? And this is what he said to me. You don't want me to speak up. I whisper to save your life. If I spoke up, you'd be dead by now. I was like, God, just keep whispering then. Keep whispering. The judgment of God has not hit America. The mercy of God is still over our land, and it is up to us to keep crying out for mercy. Now, I want you to hear the rest of this, and I'll close. As Yahweh paused before Abraham, so Abraham came forward to present his case. Now we're talking the legal God here, the one who made us a last will and testament, the one who made a covenant with us and bound it legally, written in blood, so that it was ratified. Are you really going to sweep away the righteous while you judge the wicked? Now, we're talking, as I said earlier, there was 500,000 people in Sodom. And God starts out, Abraham starts out negotiating with God. He said, if I can find 50, 50 of 500,000, what is that? Is that even 1%? I don't think it is. I think it's more like 0.01%. If I can find 0.01% righteous, would you save the city? And God said, I would. And Abraham's negotiating, so he goes down to 45, then he goes down to 40, then he goes down to 35, gets all the way down to 10. 10 out of 500,000. He says, if there's just 10 out of 500,000, I I won't wipe out the city. Now, this should be the biggest hope you've heard today for America Mm -hmm. because I know good and well, I know good and well that we have more than this. 10 out of 500,000 is like 0.002. I mean, it is such a tiny percentage. And God said, if there was that tiny percentage of righteous, I would not wipe out that city. But there was not. We in America, we got a whole lot more than that that's righteous. And it is time that we negotiate for our land. It is time that we negotiate for our nation once again. It is time for the church to arise and be the one who is a friend of God and has influence over God in the position of praying and interceding and standing in the gap. Isn't it time that we stop talking like the world and talking like culture? Isn't it time that we talk like God created inside of us, his very sound inside of us, filling us with the sound? Sound of heaven in Acts chapter 2. You were not supposed to sound like the earth. He said, you sounded too much like the earth. I'm going to give you the sound of heaven. And if you don't know any other way to pray, pray in the spirit. Make the sound of heaven come forth for America. America. If you don't know anything else to do, pray in the spirit and let the Holy Ghost intercede for our nation. For I don't know about you, but I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet here. 
God wants us to stand in the gap and negotiate for the land. This is an awesome time to be alive. It is not a bad time. It's the best time to be alive. And great things are coming for the church. And great things are coming for the house of God. And great things are coming for you and your family and your future. You are intercessors, great gap standers. You are awesome watchmen on the wall. And God is calling us to arise and take our place again and not be afraid and never back off in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it's powerful and it cuts deep inside of us and it awakens us, Father. Prune our hearts, Father, and cut back all the dead stuff off of us. Father, I just speak prophetically to every person in this room and I ask that you prune all of our hearts and our minds and our thinking so that we don't think like the world, we don't act like the world, we don't talk like the world, we don't process like the world. Father, cause us to have ears only for your spirit, Father, and that things that the world has to say, that we just have deaf ears to the sound of the Antichrist and the Antichrist spirits that are coming forth and having so much voice around us, Father. I thank you that you have a still, small voice, but you speak loudly within our spirits. And I thank you, Father, that we retune our hearts to hear from you only. And that we take our position and we take our stand. And we are not afraid to be your church in our nation that we call one nation under God. Indivisible. Father, I thank you that when we are one nation under God, we are not divided. So right now, Father, this nation looks so divided. It looks and sounds and acts so divided. But Father, I know that is a lie from the pit of hell, for we are still one nation under God, and we come against the spirit of ragash and anger and division and hatred that is trying to be unleashed here by the Antichrist spirit. And we pray for those who are deceived and are allowing these spirits to play them and to use them and we ask you Lord to silence these antichrist spirits and any human that has yielded to the sound of the antichrist Father I ask that you silence them and you take away their influence until they can talk like you and I ask you Lord to raise up more who sound like you give influence give position Father so that your voice can be heard above the noise of the Antichrist spirit. And I thank you, Father, for unity and peace and tranquility. I thank you, Father, that Jesus Christ is Lord in America, that you rule and you reign in this land. And I thank you, Father, that you are not done with America, for we speak and prophesy. Can these dry bones live? Yes, Lord, America will live again. Your church will live strong within America, and we will not be defeated. We will stand still and see the salvation of the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's eat. <laughs> Pastor, you want to pray? You all are amazing. Thanks so much. Do you like that? Yeah. That's good preaching. Amen. Thank you, brother. Hallelujah. I have to fall down my face and repent all over again. Yes. That's good. I get real irritated when I hear people curse the country. Yeah. Christians, tongue talkers, saying it doesn't mean anything anymore. Bull crap. <laughs> Do you understand? I mean, bull. We need to rise up and be the church. It's time to tear down the, the, the communists and get them out. You hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. No socialism, no I'm so glad you flew out of communist held California. Yeah. I'm just, you know, yeah. it's just cool. I'm really, really close to Sodom right now. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I really, oh, I'm telling you, I was, me and Jim was back there, and I just kind of flew a little bit. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really tired of it. I'm telling you. It's time to get fired up. Time to do your job and vote. Yeah. Time to pray. Yeah. Time to speak the word. 
and quit speaking foolishness. Right. And vote. And vote. Forever. Right. Forever. In, in every position, yes. yes. We have to. That's right. They're getting, they're getting ready. They're getting ready in there. I saw one more thing while you were saying that. You ready? It's uh, Genesis uh, 18, 18. Taking out Abraham, putting America in its place. America shall surely be a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in her. That's exactly what this nation has done ever since its creation was bless the world. It will not falter. Amen? Amen. It will not. Amen. Washington had a vision. He believed the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And the best days are yet to come. Amen. 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 And there's so much about Israel that's happening, what she was saying. So much. And, uh, you know, you, you, people aren't even watching and paying attention to it. It takes a foreign nation now to, no, to nominate for the Nobel Prize. Uh, you know, it's just amazing. Y'all better get ready. The best is yet to come. The biggest part of our calling is about to come. So we may need to be rising up, all right? Amen. Uh, won't you come up? And I don't mean to do that to you, but I mean, I know there's certain things. We've, when we do food, like we started doing the ice cream last time and all that, it's gone real well, but we wanted to remind you of something today because we care about you. All right. Um, be, we will be serving.